Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interviews with prominent authors and historians specializing really in the colonial period. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Christine Despigna, the author of Founding Mortar, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. So this segment is brought to you by The Real American Revolution, television series, and also the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So Christian, why don't you introduce our guest today? Ben, thanks for being with us. Uh, Benjamin L. Karp is the author of Defiance of the Patriots, the Boston Tea Party and the, Making of the, um, and the Making of America that was published in 2010 and won the Triennial Society of the Cincinnati Cox Book Prize in 2013, and also the author of Rebels Rising, Cities and the American Revolution that was published in 2007. He's written articles for Colonial Williamsburg, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He received the Leverhulme Research Fellowship the Charlotte W. Newcomb Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship and the Andrew W. Mellon, Mellon Fellowship in Humanistic Studies. Prior to joining Brooklyn College, he taught at the University of Edinburgh and Tufts University. Ben, welcome. Thank you. Ben, we're delighted to have you with us. So for our first question, now for the last few months, really, Christian and I have been sporing uh, smallpox epidemics in around basically uh, that ravaged Boston during the 1721 and 1764 epidemics. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to begin to extend our focus a little bit beyond that to focus on things that impacted Dr. Joseph Warren aside from the smallpox, you know, other incidents in his life and everything. But specifically, I wanted to ask you that since the cities were obviously vectors of the disease and centers for mass protest, uh, because primarily people lived in proximity to one another, how did the cities really function during the years of the revolution? Were they, um, were, were they continuing to be centers of smallpox and, and, and the, the, the trigger for protests or what generally happened in these cities? Sure, I mean, uh, cities could be vectors for smallpox, but obviously smallpox afflicted people in less densely populated areas as well. I mean, two things about the cities that I think surprised people from the 18th century is that on the eve of the American Revolution, fewer than 5% of people lived in cities. Uh, and that's the old census definition of a city as being like 2,000 or more people. Um, and the cities are really tiny. I mean, Philadelphia, which is the largest on the eve of the American Revolution, 40,000 people. Boston, 16,000 people. Uh, and it had been pretty flat in terms of its growth for much of the, uh, of the 18th century. And so people, knew each other. It, 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 you know, there are college campuses these days that are bigger than that, right? Um, uh, and so these are relatively um, intimate places in a way, but they are also pretty tight, right? I mean, uh, um, you could walk them, right? They're only about a mile, uh, you know, from end to end uh, uh, during this period. So uh, on the one hand, yes, they are um, places where people can concentrate and protest much more easily than in rural areas. Uh, and there are also places where people can concentrate and catch things from one another, uh, unfortunately, uh, much more easily than in less densely populated areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, I wanted to just bring this up about the Tea Party because really there's several monumental events that really occurred in the decade prior to independence. And usually when you name them, people know it right away. Paul Revere's Midnight Ride, the Boston Massacre, Lexington and Concord. And, and these continue to resonate and have meaning today, but really the Boston Tea Party continues to be relevant for really both sides of the political divide. And we can go back a few years and talk about the Tea Party political movement. And more recently, people were comparing the George Floyd Black Lives Matter protest to the, Black, to the Boston Tea Party. Can you talk a little bit about that and why this event is so relevant today still? Sure. I mean, I think, uh, it, you know, it's one of those incidents, right, where people, uh, it, the original Tea Party, right, people defied the law by destroying what would today be about a million dollars worth of private property uh, in the name of what they thought of as a, uh, a higher cause, right? Uh, um, you, you know, and so how you feel about that, <laughs> right, um, can vary quite a bit. Um, you know, you know, all sorts of us, right, have laws that we don't like, right? But we also live, you know, in a society of laws and we, we generally want to live in places where people, you know, obey the laws that we've all agreed upon in a democratic republic, right? Um, so it's a very tricky thing, right? How different groups feel about the Tea Party and want to invoke it, right? 
varies a whole lot across uh, the, the history of the American Revolution. Looked at one way, right, the Boston Tea Party is super heroic because it helps, you know, create the, uh, the United States and all these other things. But looked at from another way, right, do we really want to live in a place where a bunch of people who are mad about, um, about a law that was going to actually reduce their taxes, uh, you know, can go off and, uh, and infringe upon private property like that. And so, you know, especially because property destruction occurred during, you know, in, in small ways during the Black Lives Matter protests, which were largely uh, uh, peaceful, right? Uh, peaceful demonstrations that we all respect right. under the First Amendment, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that there was some property damage, right, led to a backlash. That backlash in turn led some people to hop on Twitter and say, hey, right, uh, you know, destroying property in the name of civil rights is as old as 1773, right? <laughs> but, you know, you, sometimes you're, that comparison is valid and sometimes it's like, well, hold on, let's look at what, what the original event was like. And if that kind of thing drives people to look at the history a bit more closely and derive uh, inspiration from it, then I think that's all to the good. All right. Well, as we're looking at history and all of us are involved always, it seems it's endless uh, in the involvement that we have in, in doing historical research. So from a research perspective or standpoint, one's always hoping to find some new or undiscovered document, you know, or material culture piece that you haven't seen before, you know, that was there anything in particular that you'd uncovered during your particular research about the Tea Party that came as a, a big surprise or a shock? Yeah, there were a few things. I mean, one thing that I did was um, I really wanted to know, you know, that we have these lists, some are big, some are small, of people who supposedly had participated in the Boston Tea Party. And what I wanted to do is, you know, something that's easier now because of digital resources and the compilations that archivists have done and things like that is actually drill down and kind of say, okay, who were these guys? How old were they? Uh, what were their jobs? Where were they from? Right? And to really sort of build a social and political profile of the guys who may or may not have uh, been dumping the tea into Boston Harbor. Um, and at the time at Tufts, I was teaching a research seminar course on Massachusetts and the American Revolution. And I had these, uh, this idea like, oh, you know, digging into one of these, these guys, especially if they're obscure but not too obscure, would be a perfect little research project for smart history majors, uh, you know, mostly juniors and seniors. And so I actually um, had them and credited their research when they found cool stuff, right? I had them uh, doing some of that work. And so that was really neat. But the, the, the source that I personally thought was the most significant that no one had really connected to the Boston Tea Party before, as far as I know, um, was the William Palfrey papers at, um, at Harvard's Houghton Library. Um, uh, Palfrey was a close associate of John Hancock. Um, he later becomes, uh, I believe, the paymaster general uh, uh, during the Revolutionary War. So he was, you know, one of these uh, figures in the Revolutionary Movement and the Revolutionary War who was important, but really not that well known. I mean, it becomes a very uh, famous and wealthy family. But um, he was traveling around to London, to New York, to Philadelphia, um, and seems like he was engaged in conversations with other people who were sons of liberty uh, elsewhere in the British Empire. And one of the things that was just fascinating to me is right before the Boston Tea Party happens, he's in New York, he's in Philadelphia, they know about the Tea Act, New York and Philadelphia had gotten their smuggling down, had, had gotten their legal imports of tea down to zero. They were getting all their tea through smuggling. Um, and, they, and, uh, and what was interesting was how low Boston's reputation actually was among the, uh, among the Sons of Liberty on the eve of the Boston Tea Party. He's saying, look, if we don't, if, if we accept the tea and pay the taxes on it, we will never be able to recover our reputation among the Sons of Liberty in New York and Philadelphia. They think that we are just the worst, right? And we think of Boston as always being the vanguard, right? As being the ones who were making the British government the angriest of all the, um, of all the places on the Eastern seaboard. But actually among the Sons of Liberty, New York and Philadelphia were a little nervous that Boston wasn't going to hold up its end as far as you know, maintaining the boycotts, you know, doing everything that needed to be done in order to put pressure on London merchants and then, and then in turn put pressure on Parliament to, um, to repeal all of these various hated uh, uh, taxes and regulations. So that was the interesting thing for me was, you know, that document is the one thing where it's like, oh, I, I, I really do have something new I can say here, which is that Boston it was, was really feeling pressure, not just from Governor Hutchinson and the usual bad guys, but they're also feeling pressure from their fellow Sons of Liberty in other colonies as well. 
Right. You really need another um, book on smuggling too. Well, there, there's some great stuff on smuggling, believe me. But you know, by <laughs> definition, smuggling is one of those things that's hard to find documentation about. Um, right. uh, but cool. John Tyler's book, Smugglers and, and Patriots, is just right. great on this because he had the innovation to look at those Ezekiel Price papers at the Boston Athenaeum, and you, yeah. you know, right, even if you're a smuggler, you still have to insure your vessels. And so he, he you know, he discovered all this really interesting stuff. But yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's more to do. Sure. Uh, if the documents can be found. Yeah. Right. You know, I want to jump the gun a little bit here, and I know you're working on your third book, and we'd love to have you back when that book is published. But for now, I know you're writing the book about the burning of New York City on September 21st, 1776. Yeah. And re I know you're beginning the book by talking about the burning of Charlestown, and you also are talking about the letter that Abigail Adams writes to her husband about the death of Warren. And really, that letter is... I, at least I personally feel is a standout in that treasure trove of correspondence between them. But yeah. a lot of people, if you mention that letter, they're more focused on Bunker Hill and less so on Warren. So can you talk a little bit about that and really like what a blow Warren's death was to the Patriot movement and, and Patriots like John and Abigail Adams at the time? Sure. I mean, I think your book and, you know, and, and, and other works really show, I mean, your book in particular really shows that Warren was on the cusp of not just being a kind of local Massachusetts leader. And Samuel Adams himself is sometimes denigrated by historians as only being important in Massachusetts, right? Edmund Morgan says right. that, right? Not somebody who had continental vision like Washington or Hamilton or something like that. Um, you know, but, but Warren, right, who is extremely important in the, in the state or the colony level uh, resistance movement, um, you know, your book uh, as, uh, really shows that, you know, he was somebody who was also on the cusp of uh, being a real national leader. Who knows what kind of military role he might have played? Who knows what kind of political role he might have played, right? Smart guy, brilliant orator, um, you know, someone who knew how to make, you know, connections, you know, how to work with people from different levels of society, um, you know, could have done all sorts of stuff, right? Dr. Thomas Young, right? Somebody else who dies uh, during the war. Well, I mean, Benjamin Church does too, but, uh, um, you know, obviously isn't welcomed in the, in the American pantheon. But, um, you know, I, I mean, Thomas Young, even more radical probably, right? Like, if these guys had survived the war, who knows what kinds of contributions they might have made? Who knows how they might have shifted the discourse in terms of the founding of the country, whether they made, would have been able to urge changes in the constitutional settlement that, uh, that resulted? Just really hard to know, right? We, we can't play in counterfactuals too much, right? But right, but, right the, the immediate aftermath, and I think it's a couple of letters from Abigail Adams that she writes to John in the, in the aftermath of Charlestown. There's a few different things that they're mourning, right? I mean... You know, like I think something like 1,400 people had died on both sides. Most of them uh, were, were British uh, soldiers and officers. Um, uh, the, the Americans were, had also lost the battle, right? They, they had given up the, uh, the position. Uh, right. and, and this town, this substantial town of 400 buildings, um, you know, it, it was just reduced to, you know, brick chimneys, right, and smoking rubble. Uh, and this was the first of many, many towns that were uh, destroyed or partially destroyed uh, during the American Revolution. And it is shocking. And it is a grievance that's mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. And that's a subject that has interested me for a long time. This particular book is going to be focusing on New York, which is a mysterious fire. But most of the fires were very unambiguous, right? Started by either the British or, um, or the Americans or by bandits or Native, Native Americans or, you know, or other groups, um, you know, that were operating on the continent and a little bit in the British Isles as well and in the Caribbean. Um, and it's a, it's a factor in the revolution that's important because one of the things that we talk about when we talk about the 18th century is, was this a moment of humanity and warfare, right? Was this a, a, a time when, you know, between you know, the wars of religion of the 17th century and then total war in the 19th century where, you know, there, where there was a kind of more genteel form of, um, of conducting war. And that's something that historians have actually debated quite a bit. You can talk about it in terms of treatment of prisoners, talk about it in terms of treatment of women and children and other non-combatants. What I got interested in was the, um, the destroying of, of civilian property. When, when, when do you think that book's going to be published. Uh, a couple you years. Still have a long way yeah. to go. Or? I, I mean, I'm almost done with a full draft, um, but I want to do some heavy editing on it. I have to get some images. I want to commission right. some maps. I got. I still have some stuff to do, and 
um, you know, as with everything else, the pandemic has slowed down some things. Yeah. Right. So can we lock you in now to come back when the book oh, is published? Oh, absolutely. I would love. Right, great. Uh, I would love to talk about it. Only have a little bit on you know uh, on on June seventeenth, seventeen seventy five. That fateful day for uh, right. for Warren. Um, you know, this is my first book that really is squarely in the war years rather than the years of resistance when when Warren was most active. Um, right. That, that's been really fun, and uh, you know, it has gotten me into some sources I really haven't used before. Right. And I was excited when I heard it was that you were working on it because I know it's been a few years since you, I know you've done other things, but I'm excited that you have a book coming out. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got sidetracked by doing article length projects and a textbook and, you know, all, right. all sorts of life. You've been busy, but I'm glad you're coming with the book. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, Ben and Christian, that's really all the time we have today for our discussion. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ben. Appreciate it for providing us with a keen insight and your knowledge as well. So we'll hope you come back. We'd love to have you. Yeah. And to the viewers, we hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Christian, uh, or Christian Despigna, giving you a doctor credential there, Christian. I'll take it, Randy. No <laughs> we'll, problem. We'll say goodbye for now. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Thanks to both of thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. All right. Bye.